this study. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that this text would impact us in a powerful way, God, that we would be changed by it, that we'd be moved by it, Lord, that you would uh, give us humble, teachable hearts to receive whatever you want us to receive. We ask that you would anoint us and guide us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever found yourself getting so focused on the blessings of God that you've kind of, sort of neglected God? You've, you've lost focus on God. So often when we come to the Lord, many of us, not all of us, but many of us, we come to the Lord with nothing and then he begins blessing our socks off by his grace. He gives us more and more and more. And as he gives us more and more and more, sometimes our focus shifts and we begin focusing on the blessings of God and ultimately we neglect the blessed, the one who actually bestowed all these blessings on us. The title, of this teaching tonight is discontent with the kingdom. Discontent with the kingdom. Got it. So God, he's blessed David substantially. He's established his kingdom. He's given him so much more than he deserves. Now in this passage, we're going to see David, he calls for a census. He's basically uh, balancing or weighing out God's blessing. Specifically, he wants to see how many warriors he has in the kingdom. He begins to get so focused on the amount of people, how God has grown his kingdom that he begins neglecting the true king of the kingdom. Now we'll see that there are likely many reasons uh, why David uh, called for this census as to the sins that David committed, and we'll talk about all of those, but we will see that there's this discontentment in David's heart Let's look at it in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. So it says that the Lord was angry with Israel before the census even happened, which poses the question, why? Why was God angry with the Israelites? The answer I don't know. We don't really know why God was angry with the Israelites. Perhaps it was because they kept rejecting David. They wanted Absalom, then Sheba. Uh, but the reality of it is the text doesn't make it clear exactly why God was initially angry with Israel. But we see that David was moved against them, that being Israel, to call for this census. Now the New King James Version, if you have a New King James uh, Version Bible, we see this capital, he moved David, which would make many of us assume that he would be God. But when you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 7, we actually see that it was Satan that moved David to call for this census. So, David, he's moved by Satan to go number Israel and Judah, specifically the warriors. Well, we have to look back to Exodus chapter 30 to understand this whole census idea. Uh, there were times where God called for a census, but he gives specific directions in his word, in the Torah, in uh, the, the five books of Moses as to how this census was supposed to take place. And he says in Exodus chapter 30 verse 12, when you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. When you number them, that that there may be no plague among them when you number them. So typically it was to be God who moved people to do this whole census thing and number the people. And each male who was over 20 years old would come and he'd pay a, a shekel and they would count up the shekels and they would recognize there's X amount of people or X amount of fighting men in Israel. So they would get this number. However, culturally, 
men were only supposed to count what was theirs. We see that the Israelites aren't really David's to count unless God moves David to count them. Why? Because the Israelites are really God's. They're not David's. This is God's kingdom. David is a steward of God's kingdom. So the man, after God's own heart, he starts concerning himself with the numbers. How blessed is my kingdom? How has God established me? How many people are there? How blessed am I? Do you ever find yourself getting so distracted by all the blessings in your life? The house, the car, the job, the family, all these various things that God's blessed you with. And sometimes we can fall into this pattern where we're putting too much focus on the blessings and we're neglecting the blessed. We're putting too much time, effort, energy into building up our house, into uh, investing in our career path. We get busy about all these different things, though we are responsible for these things, but sometimes these things these blessings can take this, this, this hold of our heart and we can start focusing on all that God's done for us and put all our effort and energy into building up those things that we actually ultimately neglect God. In other words, have the blessings of God become your God. Have the blessings of God become your God. Have the things that God blessed you with ultimately taken the place of God on the throne of your heart. We got to be careful with this because all the blessings of God are really from God. We didn't earn them, right? It's by his grace. It's by his mercy that he bestows blessings on us. We don't earn our blessings and everything that we have in this world, wife, husband, kids, job, house, Whatever it is, the bed we sleep on, it all belongs to God. We aren't owners of it technically in the spiritual realm. We're stewards of it. And the Lord, he can give and take away as he pleases. And sometimes when we get too distracted by the blessings of God, he starts taking blessings away. Not because he wants to punish us, but because he wants to get our attention. We're focused on the wrong thing. So David, we see here, he's focused on the wrong thing. He's focused on how big his kingdom has grown. The text continues. 2 Samuel chapter 24 verse 2. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, now go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and count the people that I may know the number of the people. David wants to know how many people there are. How big is my kingdom? How much has God blessed my reign? David's desire to count the people was ultimately rooted in pride. What have I accomplished? What have I accomplished for God? Uh, what's the, the fruit of my labor? How has the nation benefited from me being the king of the kingdom? Sometimes we can get too focused on the numbers in a very unspiritual way. And you see this across the board, especially in churches, right? When you ask a pastor, and I've been guilty of this, when you ask a pastor how their church is doing, what's one of the first things they end up talking about? How many people come to the church, right? We have about this many people on our Sunday services and this many people on our Wednesday services. And sometimes we take the wrong approach with this. We put too much focus on the numbers, but numbers can be deceiving. Numbers can be deceiving, especially in a church. The prosperity gospel has a great following. A lot of people follow the prosperity gospel, but it's heresy. It's heresy. If you seek the Lord, he's going to bless you with all these material possessions. That's not necessarily true. He might, but that's not what the Bible actually says. The Lord blesses poor people. See, Sometimes we can get too focused on the numbers and get distracted and even deceived by the numbers. However, we do see in the book of Acts that God, 
He grew the church daily. The church was multiplying each and every day, the Bible says. There was people coming to faith every single day. So we do see that, yes, there is this reality that if God's blessing uh, a church, that there are going to be numbers, but the numbers can be deceitful. Why? Because what kind of people is the church producing? What's the character of the disciples that are coming to faith? Uh, What's the fruit in the church? The Pharisees, they had a great following. But it says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 12, Jesus rebuking the scribes and Pharisees. In other words, he says, you're producing twice the sons of hell as yourself. He says, yeah, you got a great following, but you're basically raising people up to go to hell because they don't know me. They don't know the Lord. They don't know the gospel. They haven't accepted the gospel. An abundance of fruit. If it's bad fruit, it's just an abundance of bad fruit. It's about the fruit. What's the the quality? The Lord is more concerned about the quality than the quantity. And if we focus on the quality, then he'll take care of the quantity. David wants to know how many people, how many people are there in Israel? He gets focused on this numbers game. So he has this conversation with Joab. He gives him direction. And it says in verse 3, And Joab said to the king, Now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than there are. And may the eyes of my Lord the king see it. But why does my Lord the king desire this thing? Joab knew something was off. He knew this was wrong. He knew it wasn't right. He knew that David's heart wasn't in the right place. So he questions David. He asks David, man, I, I don't think this is right, man. Just focus on the Lord, in other words, and he's going he's gonna to multiply the fo- flock. You don't have to worry about that, David. Nevertheless, it says in verse 4, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the army. Therefore, Joab and the captains of, captains of the army went out from the presence of the king to count the people of Israel. Despite the fact that Joab didn't agree with David's command to count the people, Joab, he ultimately submitted to David. Why? Because David was the authority. He was the authority that God had placed in Joab's life. And we're called to submit to authority. We're called to submit to authority always unless that authority asks us to sin. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't speak up or speak out when we think our authority is making a bad decision. We see Joab did that. But David didn't agree with Joab. And David's direction ultimately prevailed. Joab went with it. It, He submitted, even though he knew this this wasn't a good choice. Sometimes supporters of leaders, sometimes it's the best thing for them to just submit to their leader's direction, even though they know their leader's not making the best decision. Why? Because sometimes the only way the leader is going to learn is by the Lord allowing them to face the consequences of their bad decision. It says so much when a supporter, whether that be a supporter in ministry or or a wife supporting their husband, whatever the case may be, whatever the dynamic may be, when there's that support and there's that submission and that leader ultimately has to learn the hard way, and God teaches them that hard way through discipline and consequences, at least that leader knows that that supporter's got their back, even if they fail, even if they make a mistake. See, Joab had the king's back until the very end. Then he betrays the king, but we're not gonna get into that tonight. But he had David's back, and he followed the direction, even though he knew it was a bad decision. David The only way he was going to learn that this was a terrible decision is through the discipline of the Lord. So the text continues. Chapter 5. And they crossed over the Jordan and camped in Aror on the right side of the town, which is in the midst of the ravine of Gad, and toward Jazer. Then they came to Gilead, to the land of Tatim, Hachi. They came to Dan Jan. 
and around to Sidon, and they came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. Then they went out to the south, uh, to south Judah, as far as Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. So we see that these captains with Joab, they end up counting all the people. And lastly, they end up counting the people in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the place where David dwelt. That was the place where his family was, where the palace was, later where the temple would be, but in the present where the tabernacle was. Sometimes the blessings that we count the last are the blessings right in front of us. Those are the last blessings counted. The people in Jerusalem. Uh, so t- sometimes we get so caught up with the big picture. We get so caught up with the future. We get so caught up with what's next that we neglect the very things that God has placed right in front of us. And maybe God's blessed you with an amazing job. Maybe he's blessed you with an amazing family. Maybe he's blessed you with an amazing spouse. Uh, maybe he hasn't, but maybe he he has. Sometimes, despite all that, we can constantly fall into that mentality where we're looking at what's next. God, what's the future hold? Uh, What do you have for me in the present? Yeah, this is all good, but it's not good enough. I want more, Lord. What more do you have for me? When everything you need is right in front of you. The Lord says, be faithful with the little things right in front of you. Be faithful to be a good steward of the things that I've entrusted to you now. And and I'll make you ruler over many things in the future. But if you can't learn to be content with the life that you have now, you're not going to be content with having more in the future. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Just worry about your relationship with the Lord. Find your contentment there and then everything else will be taken care of by the Lord. But when we're trying to do things backwards, when we're trying to to gain everything unto us uh, and, and not seeking the Lord, when we try to seek our contentment in our blessings, then guess what? We're never gonna be content. We're never gonna be happy. We're never going to experience the joy that the Lord desires us to experience. So these men, Joab and the captains, it says, it took them nine months and 20 days to fulfill this census. This was a lengthy, difficult task, but all the work in the world, all the work that these men put into fulfilling this command, submitting to this direction from David to take this census, all their hard labor is not gonna bring the king more contentment. This is point number one, your discontentment will cause others stress. Your discontentment will cause others stress. When we're discontent, it's going to cause strain on our relationships. And more often than not, it's going to cause strain on the relationships with the people that are closest to us. The kids, the wife, the husband, the friends, the family members, the whoever. They're going to see the discontentment, the unhappiness, and they're going to do whatever they can to try to please you. They're going to do whatever they can to try to make you happy. They're going to do whatever they can to try, that, try to fill that void in your heart. And guess what? They are not going to be able to do it. But you put that pressure on them because you're discontent. And they feel like it's their obligation to make you happy when it's not. It's your obligation to make you happy. And that's only going to happen through your pursuit of the Lord, through your relationship with the Lord. The problem isn't that you don't have enough. The problem is when there's discontentment. The problem is and always will be a disconnect between us and our relationship with God. Discontentment is always connected to our relationship with the Lord. Having more is not going to solve the problem. Seeking God is the only thing that's going to solve the problem. You're discontent with your relation in your relationship with the Lord. Then all the stress, all the strain that you put on your friends and family members, uh, all the effort and the energy they put into making you happy, it's never ultimately going to be enough. It's never going to please you. So David, he sends these men out, counting his blessings, all their hard work, 
It doesn't bring David the satisfaction that he's looking for. It actually ends up doing the opposite, as we'll see here in a few verses. Back to 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 9. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to the king, and there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. So we see there were 1,300 fighting men. Um, sorry, 1... 1,300,000. I don't know why I said 1,300. 1,300,000 fighting men. That's a lot of people. Uh, many scholars suggest that there was probably somewhere around 6 million people in Israel at this time. Because remember, the census was only uh, about men who were 20 years old or older that were able to fight. So you got millions of people in Israel. God truly had blessed the kingdom while David was ruling and reigning. Now there's a little discrepancy when you look at the census in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Uh, there's a variance, a difference in the numbers. Uh, we see in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 5. Let's look at it really quick. This is um, a parallel passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 5. It says, then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had uh, 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. Uh, so 1 Chronicles tells us that th there's approximately uh, 1,570,000 men who drew the sword, but uh, 2 Samuel 24 tells us that there's 1,300,000. So why is there a difference? I don't know. Both numbers can't be right. That's the reality. Uh, what many scholars suggest is uh, that it was a scribal error way back when, and this scribal error, because the scribes, one of their duties was to not write down what they think the word should say. They were to write down that transcript, uh, that, that um, document that was written on papyrus. They were to write it down exactly what was said, even though, though they knew there was a variance. The scribes, that was one of their duties. So somewhere along the line, likely in 1 Chronicles, there was someone who made a scribal error. Now, 1 and 2 Chronicles were written many years after uh, 1 and 2 Samuel. Uh, some suggest, tradition says that Ezra wrote it uh, somewhere in the 5th century. Um, so this is, this is many years after this second story that we see, this parallel passage, but there is this variance in numbers. Uh, the best explanation is that there was a scribal error somewhere along the road. Now, now, what does that say about the inspiration and inerrancy, and inerrancy of God's word? Uh, when the Bible says that the word of God is inspired by God and inerrant, it's true. But what the Bible is talking about is the original writings, the original scriptures. We don't have the original scriptures. We have copies, meaning when Isaiah wrote Isaiah or Whoever wrote 1st and 2nd Samuel wrote 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Those original writings are inerrant. But when you look at the Bible, you can actually see, especially with numbers, sometimes there's variances. Okay, the inerrancy of the Bible is based on the original writings of the Bible. Okay, so we do see this variance here between 2nd Samuel and 1st Chronicles chapter 21. Nevertheless, the text continues. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 10. And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. David realized he made a mistake. He realized that the numbers don't really matter. Once he finally got what he thought that he wanted, he realized that it didn't satisfy him. This is point number two. You don't realize, long one, what you really need until you get what you think you want. You don't realize what you really need until you get what you think that you want. So David, he thinks, oh, if I just knew how blessed my kingdom was, then I'd be satisfied, then I'd have joy, then I'd have happiness, but that's not the truth. You might think that having a spouse, 
or having a different spouse or, or having more children or, or having more money or having a different job or, or having a different path altogether, living in a different place. If these things were just different, then I'd be happy. Not true. It's not true. Th those are all lies. Our, our circumstances don't produce joy in our life. Our relationship with the Lord once again produces joy and contentment in our life. Solomon, he found this out the hard way as he discusses all throughout Ecclesiastes. I want to point you to one verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 11. He says, then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and all the labor in which I had toiled and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. He says it was all meaningless. All the work, all the labor, all the effort, all the energy. It, it didn't give me the joy that I thought I was going to get. It didn't give me the satisfaction that my heart was longing for. I thought if I just did this or I just had this or things were just different, then I'd have joy. But he found out, no, it was grasping for the wind. I was reaching for something that I couldn't catch. It was all meaningless. Are you grasping for the wind? Are you looking for joy in things other than the Lord? Are you believing the lie that if I just had things differently, if I just had a spouse, if I just had that car, if I just had a house or a nicer house, if I just had this, that, and the other, then I'd be happy. Then I'd be content. If things were different, I'd be, I'd be happier. It, it, it's not true. It, it's a lie. He says it's grasping for the wind. You're reaching for something that you're not going to find. Try to grasp the wind. Let's do it, okay? Let's do it. Try to grasp it. There's no wind in here. Just pretend, right? Nothing, right? There's nothing there. You reach with nothing in your hand. You got nothing left, right? There's nothing there. Solomon will close out Ecclesiastes and summarize basically, hey, the only meaning in this life is to seek the Lord and keep his commandments. Ultimately, it all comes down to a relationship with Jesus. That's the only way we're going to find contentment. Solomon, he's done it all. He's seen it all. He spoke it all. And he says, this is the only way you're going to find contentment. It's through following the Lord and keeping his commandments. If we're longing for anything other than God, to make us content, then we're longing for the wrong thing. We're grasping at the wind. David, he found out he was grasping at the wind. These numbers didn't matter. The numbers weren't going to satisfy him. So he recognizes that he messed up. He fell short. It says here in verse 10, and David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done foolishly. He says, I recognize, I've done wickedly. I've sinned greatly against the Lord. Now, what was his sin? We see the sin of discontentment. We see the sin of pride, but we also see the sin of distrust. He didn't trust the Lord. What do I mean? God had promised from the beginning when he gave that promise to Abraham. We see it in Genesis chapter 15 and Genesis chapter 22 that God told Abraham, hey, I'm going to bless your descendants. They're going to be as innumerable as the stars. They're going to be so vast. There's going to be so many that you're not even going to be able to count them. David, being a descendant of Abraham, he was a piece of, he was a part of this promise. God said he's going to bless the Israelites. There's going to be too many to count, too many descendants. And David, he didn't trust God's promise. He, he was testing God. Is this really true? Did God really say, or, or is God really going to do what he said he's going to do. Jesus warns us of this through this encounter that he has with Satan after he was just baptized by the Holy Spirit. He goes into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And Satan's trying to tempt him to test God. And he says in Luke chapter 4, verse 9, he says, then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it is 
has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God or test the Lord your God. In other words, if God said it, he's going to do it. I don't got to check up on God to make sure he's doing what he said he's going to do. He's going to do it. And David, he lacked trust that God was going to fulfill his promise, that he was going to have more people. There were going to be more Israelites than could even be counted. So David, he recognized the error of his ways. He says, I've sinned greatly in what I have done, but now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. David realizes his mistake, and then he comes to the Lord with repentance. It's one thing to make a mistake. It's another thing to acknowledge the mistake and to acknowledge it before the Lord. Let me ask you, have you done foolishly? Have you been too focused on the blessings that God's bestowed on you? Has there been too much effort and uh, energy uh, going towards maybe something that God has blessed you with that you find yourself neglecting the king of the kingdom? Do you find yourself in a place of discontentment? See, David He recognized that he messed up and he comes to the Lord. He pleads with the Lord and he asks forgiveness. Lord, forgive me for my discontent heart. Lord, forgive me for my pride. Lord, forgive me for my lack of trust. One thing to make a mistake, it's another thing to acknowledge it. And when we acknowledge it, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. David's forgiven but he's getting ready to get cleansed. Let's look at this next section. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 11. Now when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer saying, go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, shall seven years of famine come to you in your land, or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you, or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. So once again, David is uh, approached by another prophet to give him a word from God the Lord. Hey, Dave, you're forgiven because you confessed your sins, but that doesn't mean there aren't consequences. See, the Lord, he forgives us of our sins. He forgives us of our eternal debt. The wages of sin is death. It's eternal separation from God. That's what we deserve for our sin, no matter what it is. God forgives all that. Okay? That we can have fellowship with God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection. We're able to have that debt wiped clean. But that doesn't mean that there aren't consequences for our sin in the present. That there aren't consequences for the mistakes that we make. Uh, often there are, not all the time, but often there are consequences for the sin in our lives. And God, he gives us those consequences here on earth. This is part of that cleansing process. That if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sometimes that cleansing process is painful. Sometimes that cleansing process, it comes through the form of discipline or through the form of, of, of pruning. See, the Lord, because he's a good father, he disciplines the ones he loves And sometimes we face consequences for the mistakes that we made. Not because God is just like angry at us and he wants to punish us. No, it's because he loves us and he wants to prevent us from falling back into the same thing over and over and over and over again. So he gives us the consequences knowing that he needs to give us these specific consequences so that we don't keep beating our heads against a wall and doing the same dumb things, the same foolish things over and over and over and over again. God does this with David so many times. He did it in 2 Samuel chapter 12. You remember when David committed that, uh, that, that sin against Bathsheba and Uriah? He had Uriah killed. He slept with Bathsheba, committed adultery. He committed deceit. All these sins accumulating, and God had consequences for him. He lost a son. Actually, he ended up losing four sons in total. He said, there's going to be division among your household for the rest of your days. And we see all these consequences play out in David's life. But guess what? He never commits adultery or murder again. God knew the consequences that David needed in order to not fall back into the same sin over and over and over again. 
The Lord knows what David needs. He's going to discipline him. But he says, hey, you get to choose the form of discipline. So David responds in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 14. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So it appears, based on the totality of the story, that David chose uh, the three-day plague. I don't want to be handed over to to my enemies. Uh, I want the three-day plague. Now, uh, this is commendable of David. Why? Because this was putting himself and his family in jeopardy. Let's play this out. If he chooses the enemies to come and chase him down, how many, how long was that one uh, for Right. Okay. So if the three month scenario happens and the enemies chase him down for three months, those soldiers aren't going to let David and his family die. David's protected. His family will be protected. They're not letting the king die. If the famine happens, the people aren't going to let the king and his family die. But the plague could take out anyone. Anyone could get sick from the plague. Anyone could die from this disease that's that's spreading rampant. So David, he makes himself and his family vulnerable by choosing to have the three-day plague, which is also a fulfillment of what God said in Exodus chapter 30, verse 12. If the census isn't done in the appropriate way, in a God-honoring way, then there's going to be a plague among the people. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 15, So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time, from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. Point number three, others suffer from your discontentment. Others suffer from your discontentment. Others suffer from my discontentment. Others suffer from our discontentment as a whole. People suffer when we're discontent. It will affect your friends. It will affect your family members. It will affect the family of God as a whole. Uh, Discontentment, ultimately, it destroys relationships. It destroys relationships. Maybe you've gone through a season of discontentment. How many people wanted to be around you? You're always moping around, oh, woe is me. Life is terrible. Things should be different. I wish I had this. I wish things were different. And the, the mopey guy, the mopey lady, the one that's always complaining about how bad they have it. And I get people going through trials. I get all that. But when it's this consistent consistent thing that's rooted in discontentment, that it's really not based on your circumstances at all. It's your heart. People aren't going to want to be your friends. (laughs) You're going to destroy your relationships. You'll destroy your relationship with God. You'll destroy your relationship with people. They'll suffer as well, as we mentioned before. Might go through that season where they're always trying to please you. They never feel like they do good enough. They can't please dad. They can't please mom. Nothing's ever good enough. They're always unhappy. Dad's always unhappy. Mom's always unhappy. I don't know what to do. That causes turmoil in the family. That causes turmoil in our relationships across the board. Because it's not really about what they're doing or what they're not doing. It's about us and what we're doing and what we're not doing. We're not seeking the Lord. We're not having that relationship in the way that we should. So these 70,000 people, they die because of David's discontentment, because of his pride, because of his lack of trust. The text continues, verse 16. And when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it is enough. Now to restrain your hand, and the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So the angel is getting ready to stretch out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it. But the Lord ultimately relents from destroying Jerusalem. This is where David lives. This is where his family lives. So God destroyed other people, but he didn't destroy what? The people that were right next to David. Sometimes God takes certain blessings away from our life that are distracting us so that we focus on what's right in front of us. He took these things away that were further away, these people that were further away, but the very blessings that were counted last were the blessings that were ultimately preserved, the people that were right in front of David all along. So God he tells the angel, relent. He says, it is enough. It's enough. David's learned his lesson. Only God knows when enough is enough. 
Only God knows what it's going to take to get our attention. Only God knows the various forms of discipline we need to face to wake up to the reality of our sin and the destruction that it's bringing. Only God knows. Sometimes we think enough was enough way back when. God, I faced enough. And he's like, no, nope, not yet. It's still coming. You still need more. You still need some more trials. You still need some more discipline because it's not enough yet. Sometimes we think the Lord disciplines us too severely, but guess what? He knows when enough is enough. He knows when to relent. He knows when to stop. I've experienced with the, this with the Lord on several occasions. Uh, one time, uh, when me and Elizabeth first started talking, I've shared the story in the past. Uh, I wasn't allowed to pursue her for four months because of Patmos. And then uh, I started pursuing her under the spiritual authority at that time. And then I was asked not to talk to her again for a couple weeks. And I walked by her and I opened my big mouth. And that opened up the door for conversation. And then she texted me that next night. And I happened to be sitting next to Pastor Chet Lowe. And he says, who was that? He never asked me who I text, ever. He's just a prophet. He just knew. Who just texted you? Why well, he asked me, it was Elizabeth. Aren't you not supposed to be talking to her for these two weeks? Yeah. All right. Okay, it's done. And he acted like, no big deal. But it was a big deal. <laughs> the Lord disciplined me big time that season. I had to go another four months not talking to her. Uh, on top of that, there were privileges taken away from me, trips, mission trips taken away from me. I felt like the Lord was being too harsh on me. I felt his discipline was too much. I was walked away from ministry from that. That was the, one of the hardest things I, I, I experienced for me. I felt like the Lord was being too hard on me, but he wasn't. He knew exactly what I needed. He was trying to teach me something precious that I always have to choose him first. If I wanna do relationship right, if I wanna set my marriage up for success, if I want it to be blessed, I gotta find my contentment in him. Uh, I got to be satisfied with him alone, and, and I got to do things his way, not my way. His way, not my way. He knows when enough is enough, and it was a long time. I was being disciplined from the Lord, but I got the lesson. I learned it. I thought it was too much, but he knew exactly what I needed. Sometimes we think the Lord's being too hard on us, but he's not. He knows exactly what we need. So at this specific moment, at this specific time, he said, it is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Now we see in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, uh, the th threshing floor uh, where they would separate the chaff from the wheat. They would usually be on a high point, They'd throw the wheat up uh, so that they could separate the chaff from the wheat. Uh, so this is what a threshing floor was. Uh, this actually was on Mount Moriah where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. Ultimately, this is where uh, the temple would be built, uh, where Jesus would go and teach, and where Jesus just outside of this area would ultimately be crucified. So we see there's some parallel passages, some uh, 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 typologies here that are pointing to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We'll get into it in a second here. Let's look at it. Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 18. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, oh, sorry, verse 17. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, surely I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. So David, he's pleading with the Lord once again, hey, let me suffer. I don't want my sheep to suffer. Let me suffer. But this is a reality of leadership. It's not always the leader that suffers. Often the people suffer even more than the leader for bad decisions that they make. So David says, I'd rather you wipe me out and my whole family than these poor people suffer. One man makes a bad decision and 70,000 people suffer. That's the reality in leadership. So he pleads with the Lord, have mercy on these people. And we see in verse 18, and God came that day to David and said to him, go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of God, went up as the Lord commanded. Now Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Aruna went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Aruna said, 
Why has my Lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. So directed by God, David is called to go buy this threshing floor to prepare sacrifices to the Lord, to make things right with the Lord. David was providing sacrifices as an act of repentance. He confessed his sin. He, he got forgiveness from the Lord. He experienced discipline, but he still recognized that there needed to be a sacrifice. We see that David, his repentance and his confession of sin and request for forgiveness, it was sincere. David had genuine repentance. He had sincere repentance. How can we say that? Because it's proven by his actions. He didn't just say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. God, forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. No, he showed that he was sorry. He proved that he was sorry. And this is ultimately what genuine repentance will look like. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, it says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. How does he know this? Look what he says. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication, and all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Corinthians didn't just say they were sorry. They proved they were sorry. And, and this is what repentance really looks like. Sometimes we come to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. He's like, no, you're not. Why? Because if you were sorry, you wouldn't just tell me. You'd show me. You'd prove that you were sorry. Because yeah, you'd turn from what I keep telling you to turn from. That we can tell the Lord that we're sorry till we're blue in the face. But the sincerity of our sorrow will be proven in the way that we repent in our actions, not just in our words. See, David, he's not just talking about it. He, he's doing something about the situation. He, he's ready. He's willing to go up and provide these sacrifices to the Lord. But there's a problem. The land that he's called to provide these sacrifices is owned by someone else, this guy, Aruna. So it says in verse 22, now Aruna said to David, let my Lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these, O king, Aruna has given to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Hey, it's all yours, David. Take it. You're the king. I'm giving you the sacrifices. I'm giving you the land. Take it all. Look how David responds here in verse 24. Then the king said to Aruna, nah, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. So David, he refused to accept the sacrifices for free. He refused to accept the threshing floor for free. David knew that his sacrifice had to cost him something. This is point number four contentment doesn't come from having more it comes from sacrificing more contentment doesn't come from having more it comes from sacrificing more God calls us to a life of sacrifice and sacri sacrificial living as defined is costly. It, it costs us something. In Romans chapter 12, it says, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of service. That's a, a reasonable response to the grace of God in our life is to live a life of sacrifice, a, a life that costs us something. If your Christian world walk doesn't cost you anything, then it's not worth anything. This is the life God's called us to live. God wants us to live self-sacrificial lives for him and for others. He doesn't want us to 
give him something that doesn't cost us anything. He, he doesn't want us to, to give him our leftovers. He wants our first fruits. He wants our best. In Malachi chapter one, we see God rebuking the priests because they're offering the lame and the weak and the blind. They're offering all these lambs and sacrifices that are blemished and God demanded unblemished lambs, unblemished sacrifices. Why? Because God wants our best. They were robbing God. Jesus doesn't want our leftovers. He wants our best and our best is costly. It, it costs us something to give the Lord our best. That's why Jesus commends Mary in John chapter 12 for anointing him with that fragrant oil. That fragrant oil was a year's wages. She anointed the Lord for his burial and he says, hey, whoever hears the gospel is gonna hear your story, Mary, because this is the type of worship I'm calling you to, a worship that costs you something. It's sacrifice. Sometimes we'll, we'll think we're, we think we'll be happier if we just have more. I just need more. I just need more. But the reality is oftentimes we won't find contentment until we sacrifice more because our relationship with the Lord isn't about us. It's about him. It's about sacrificing for him. It's not about all the blessings that he bestows on us. It's about what we're sacrificing for the Lord. Less is more, at least less is often more in the kingdom of God. So David, at first, he wanted to know how much do I have? And now he's being asked to sacrifice. So he says here in verse 25, David, he offered the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. Why? Because he was commanded to, but David also recognized that the consequences of his sin weren't enough. There still had to be a sacrifice. He knew what the author of Hebrews will tell us later in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. We see the sacrifice was provided on the very place where they would ultimately build the temple. As I mentioned, the very place where Jesus came and taught during his earthly ministry, the very place that just outside of this area, Jesus was sacrificed. Without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we're still dead in our sins. The sacrifice ultimately points to the finished and completed work of Jesus Christ. He died on a cross for our sins. He rose again from the grave without that sacrifice, without the gospel. We're still dead in our sins. Jesus provided the ultimate sacrifice for us so that we could have a relationship with him. And we see, though the Lord relented, his mercy could only be extended when his wrath was quenched. It's a picture of Jesus. We can only receive the mercy of God when the wrath of God is quenched. We see through the cross that Jesus, he bore the wrath of God for us, what we deserve. He took it upon himself. He paid the price for all of us. So it says here after the sacrifice, okay, now, really, okay, so the, the, the angel relented already, but this is key. Look at the last part of verse 25. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land, and the plague with, was withdrawn from Israel. He put a hold on the plague. <laughs> the angel relented, but until these sacrifices were provided, God <laughs> didn't fulfill, uh, completely quench his wrath. He was holding it off until these sacrifices were provided. So we see that David repented and God ultimately relented. Maybe you've been caught up in this cycle of constantly chasing the blessings of God, constantly focused on all the things that you have in your life, more money, more stuff, a better job, a better career path, a better car, a better this, a better that, a different this, a different that, a different place, a different path, whatever the case may be that you lost sight of God. Maybe you've fallen into a season of discontentment where you just aren't happy. You don't know where your joy is. You lost your joy. Let me tell you, you know where you're gonna find it? You're gonna find it through your pursuit of Jesus. That's the only way you're gonna find it. 
Don't believe the lie that if things are different, then I'd find my joy. It's not the truth. If things were different in your relationship with God, then, then you'd find the joy. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. If we're abiding in Him, if we're walking in the Spirit, we're gonna have joy. We're gonna have contentment. When we step outside the Spirit, now we're experiencing discontentment. We lose focus. We lose sight of what's important. It's a chance to repent, to turn back. Perhaps God is telling you it's not that you need more, you actually need less. Instead of asking God for more blessings, maybe we should be asking God, what do we need to sacrifice more of? <laughs> if we're too focused on all this stuff, maybe God says you need to get rid of some of that stuff. You need to get rid of some of those distractions. They're damaging your relationship with people. They're damaging your relationship with God. So we close this series with David making another mistake. But there's still grace for David. David, despite the fact that he messed up again. You know, it would kind of be like more uplifting if there was another chapter, right? I mean, we got First and Second Kings, and we see where David dies in the uh, ultimate end of his rule. But Second Samuel ends on this. Second Samuel ends on David making a mistake and turning back to the Lord. We see that David, up until his last breath, was the man after God's own heart. He remained the man after God's own heart. He loved God to the very end. And this is truly where our contentment is found, when our hearts are really set on God, when he is truly sitting on the throne of our hearts, when he is our priority, when we make him preeminent of our life, then and only then will we experience the joy that he offers for us. Yo, the one who created our hearts is the only one that can fulfill the longings of our hearts. It's so easy, especially in the country that we live in, to, go to, get, to get so distracted by, by what we don't have. We want more. They got more. He's got more. I want more. But the Lord says, my grace is sufficient. You got all you need right in front of you. All, I am all you need. Sadly, sometimes we don't realize God is all we need until God is all we have. God, he's so gracious to bless us abundantly, but it can't be about the blessings. It can't be about the numbers. It can't be how our kingdom on this earth is being established. It has to be about our relationship with the Lord and our pursuit of him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. God, we thank you for your grace. Lord David, the man after your heart, Lord, he made mistakes and, and we mess up. We make bad decisions, but we know that your grace is sufficient. The sacrifice of your son was enough. Lord, and we thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that you would correct us if we're getting too focused on the wrong things. Lord, if, if there's any one of us who has lost our joy, I pray that we would remember where to find it, that we would find it in you. God, that we would recognize the consequences of discontentment and pride and, and mistrust. Lord, and we turn from all of that that you change our hearts, that you change our perspective, that we would see how good you are, Lord, that we don't need anything more. If you want to give us more, great, God, but I pray that we would be content where we're at, content because we have you, and you are all we need. In Jesus' name, amen.